This webinar will be a conversation between Peter Lillidal and Erin Null, Associate Director and Publisher for Corwin, about the little things we can do that make a big difference in how students experience a thinking classroom. Peter Lillidal is a professor of mathematics education in the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University. He is a former high school mathematics teacher who has kept his research interests and activities close to the classroom. With a passion for fostering deep mathematical thinking and problem solving skills, Peter has dedicated his career to reshaping classroom environments and is best selling author of Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics, 14 Teaching Practices for Enhanced Learning, as well as Modifying Your Thinking Classroom for Different Settings, which have literally, literally transformed the way teachers are getting students to think about math around the world. And joining Peter today is Erin Null. Erin joined Corwin in 2014, where she founded and launched the Corwin Mathematics imprint. She is now Associate Director and Publisher for Corwin Mathematics and STEM. In her role as Peter's editor and publisher, Erin works closely with Peter to translate his research into his books around, around the thinking classroom. The first of which was Building Thinking Classrooms in Mathematics, which has made its way into hundreds of thousands of classrooms. And now I will turn it over to Peter and Erin. Welcome. Thank you, Margaret. Thank, thank you, Margaret. <clears throat> hey, Peter. Uh, how are you? I'm, I, it's funny because the introduction actually mentioned where I am today. I'm actually coming to you from my office at Simon Fraser University. Yes, and in all the years I've known you, I've never actually seen you there. <laughs> I think in all the years you've been I'm not sure I've been here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them that. No. Um, it's been really fun logging on and seeing so many friends who we both know and are on first name hugging bases with. Yeah. Uh, nice to have everyone join us today. And um, Peter, I'm just delighted to have the chance to sit down with you in this capacity. Um, you know, we've worked closely together for years now. We are in communication multiple times pretty much every day. And yet it's so rare that we get a chance to sit down and just talk about the work and kind of to use our friend Chase's term geek out together. Yeah. So I'm um, yes. thrilled. I always have the opportunity, love the opportunity to do that. We don't get enough of that. Yeah. And, and I know how busy you are. So it, I really appreciate this time that you've set aside for Corwin and for all of our friends who've joined us here today. Excited to be here. I'm, I'm, and, you know, it's like, yes, geeking out with 600 of our closest friends. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So um, before we dive in, I thought we'd do a little icebreaker because I know people, one of the things people love about you is how accessible you are and how personable you are and how they like to feel like they know you. And I've walked around conferences with you enough and seen you're so gracious. You give people hugs and selfies and the time of day. Um, and we always love to know little things about you that nobody else knows. So you're familiar with the game, Two Truths and a Lie. I'm sure yeah. you've played it before. <clears throat> so I, I want you to tell us Two Truths and a Lie. And for those of you watching this webinar, go ahead and put in the chat which one you think is the um, the lie. And we'll see how how well we know Peter. So uh, I heads up, I did get a little warning about this. So I was able to construct my two truths and a lie here. I'm not doing this off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> I'm better at the truth than I am at the lies. Um, but OK, so here goes. Uh, number one, I'm a big car guy, always have been. Um, ever since I was young, it was I was fascinated by cars, muscle cars. My dream car was to get a 67 Mustang Fastback. I finally realized that dream in my 40s. I still have it stored away. I bring it out on sunny days. Uh, yeah, so that's number one. Number two, um, I'm a big skier. Like I ski a lot. Uh, in fact, my whole family are skiers. One of my one of my children, in fact, is a professional extreme skier, the kind that you see on YouTube videos doing crazy, insane things. 
And the third one is uh, I actually spent 10 years working as a carpenter, um, loved construction. In fact, uh, carpentry is still my fallback plan if this BTC thing doesn't work out. Okay, so I'm seeing the chats come in. I'm seeing number two and number three are high contenders for being the lie. Few people saying number one. Most people saying number two and number three. Give it a minute. And then I'm going to take a shot. Yeah, this is... Okay. This this chat is flying fast here. Yeah, it's. I'm just getting a, an estimation here. So most people, I'd say most people are saying number two and number three. And I'm going to go with number one. You are not a muscle car guy. I do know that you're a skier. I do know that your son is a professional skier. And I do know that you were a carpenter. Yeah. Did I get it right? You got it right. Ah, uh, all right. Yeah. I could care less about the car I'd ride, to be honest. <laughs> In fact, I believe you have a car that you never drive because you're never home. <laughs> I, have, I have a car I never drive. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, the other, the other ones were true. Yes. Truth is stranger than fiction when it comes to me sometimes. Now, if you ever see Peter at a conference, ask him to show you the vid video of his son extreme skiing. It's bananas. It is bananas. Okay. So um, when we were at the first annual BTC conference last summer in July, um, in Franklin, Indiana, you did a session called The Little Things That Matter. And I was in that session, mm. listening carefully. And I remember walking out of there and looking at the teachers and the coaches who had attended and their eyes were just popping. They were just like, oh my God, that's the thing. That's the thing I was missing. That's that that little mm, that I just, I needed that. Um, so you and I thought that this would be a good time to share some of those little things that are really big things, um, depending on, on your perspective. So tell me a little bit more about um, the topic of this conversation and why you wanted to talk about this. You know, like building thinking classrooms is this research into like, what are the big things that we need, need to change in order to get students to start thinking? And like, there's big things, like we're gonna do random groups. We're going to get them up at the whiteboard. We're going to give them a thinking task. We're going to defront our classroom, right? We're going to turn assessment upside down. We're not going to answer their question. Like these are big moves, right? Um, and of course, when we when we talk about big moves, I call them um, macro moves. Um, we expect big change, but there's also little things that make a big difference. And sometimes that little thing makes a big difference in that it supports the macro move. Sometimes it just creates more of a, uh, a welcoming space for students. It, it treats them better in terms of social emotional. Uh, sometimes it's an efficiency for us, right? It's a small thing that just helps things become more efficient for us so that our job gets easier and more, more, more feasible to, to achieve some of those macro moves. Um, and, I'm just blown away by what a sm how these small things make such a big difference. So I, I'm just going to give one example. Um, so it's February 12th. Um, in the last 14 months, I have taught or co-taught 110 lessons in kindergarten to grade 12 classrooms. I got to be there for some of them. It was really yes, fun. Yes, <laughs> you have been there for some of them. Yeah. Um, and most of those have been with teachers observing. Anywhere from five to six teachers observing to like 35 teachers observing. I just finished doing some lessons where we had 70 teachers observing. Um, and what because I'm doing this so much, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working on trying to figure out how do we make this space as authentic as possible so that the teachers get to see what building thinking classrooms looks like without the kids being so weirded out by the fact that there's 35 people in the classroom watching them. Um, and because I'm doing this so much, I have an opportunity to just work on it and work on it and work on it. And what I'm working on is not the teaching, that's, that's in the book, right? It's what I'm working on is how do I introduce the students to these 35 teachers? So, I've developed this method um, and some of, I, there might actually be some people here today who have been in some of these sessions, but, but the method is this. 
So I go in and I mingle with the kids. And Aaron, you've seen me do that. And and because I'm gonna, I often only have five minutes to get to know them. I have to really like hyper socialize and mingle with them and get them comfortable with me. But the rest of the teachers are not in the room. It's just me and the classroom teacher who are in there mingling. And then I've seen you do it with kindergartners on the floor climbing all over you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what happens in kindergarten. You're not a yeah. fly on the wall in a kindergarten classroom. You're not. Um, but it's, and like I said, this is a script that has developed over hundreds of, of interactions this way. And it's such a small thing. And the small thing is this. So the teachers are not there when the lesson starts. I call all the students to the room or to the front of the room with me. And I get all their attention on me at the whiteboard. And when I do that, the teachers file in the back of the room quietly. And I do the same routine whether I'm working with grade ones or grade 12s or kindergartners. And then when the teachers are in the room, I ask the students to turn around. And it's like a magic trick. They're just like, wow, where did all these teachers come from? Um, and then I do something I call naming the elephant. And this is the small thing. The small thing, naming the elephant in the room. I ask the students if they recognize anybody in the room. And they'll put up their hand and I'll ask them who they recognize. And they'll say, Mrs. Smith. And then Mrs. Smith will put up her hand and wave. And then we'll go Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so. And, and, and every name that the students call, they have to put up their hand and wave. And I call this naming the elephant in the room. And, um, and then I ask them, why do you think they're here? And they usually say they're here to watch us, the kids. And I say, no, nope, they're not, get over yourself. Um, they're here to watch me and the classroom teacher. We're gonna work together. So they're not here to watch you, so you don't need to watch them, eyes on me. And I just had one of my, one of my close colleagues and one of my uh, um, BTC team members in Canada, Judy Larson was with me recently in Hawaii when I did this. And Judy has been in classrooms with me a lot of times. And Judy is one of these people that the kids just can't ignore. Like they just pull on her all the time. If she gets within 10 feet of, of kids, they're just talking to her and they want to ask her questions and they want to include her. Um, Judy was in the classroom in Hawaii when I did this. And what, the first thing she said afterwards was, I've never felt so invisible in a classroom before. Yeah. We, had, we had 35 teachers and they were up in these kids' faces, taking pictures, video recording, talking around them. The kids were completely oblivious to it. And, and like, this is what I mean. Like, we think about kids as being so unpredictable, but they are incredibly predictable when we do the right thing. And this is a this is a small thing. This naming the elephant is something I've developed over these hundreds of interactions, and it's such a small thing. And we notice right away when we don't name the elephant, the kids are just a little bit on edge. They're looking around, they're watching the people who are watching them, but it's it's that small thing. And yeah. when we do the, the right small thing, we see a massive shift in their behavior. And, and that's what I mean by these small things. It, and it's, it's just amazing how sometimes a small thing can make such a big difference. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And, and I think, you know, having read your book and thinking about the 14 practices, like you said, there's these macro practices, and then there's the micro practices. And it's really easy. I mean, I've read, I can't count how many times I've read your book. Even before it was published, I read your book more times than probably most people have read your book. But I've talked to a lot of people who've read your book multiple times as well. And all, every time you read it, depending on where your head is at, and what you've encountered already, you get something new. Mm -hmm. Some some little nugget pops out that you never really digested before. Right. And there's there's so much packed in there. There's these 14. That's a lot of big practices. And then with every one of those, there's tiny, tiny little elephants in the room, like you say, that matter, that matter a lot. Um, and I think it's it's really easy for people who aren't super familiar with your work to kind of think, oh, it's it's random groups and it's whiteboards. Go. That's it. And it's like, no, there, there's actually. So and we can dispense with some of the details. Right. And the details matter. Right. And it's so often, like you said, like so often I encounter teachers who are like, oh, this isn't working. I need some help. And I say this and then they go, oh, right. That's a piece I needed. They go away. They come back and they say that was exactly what I needed. But then I went back and I read the book and it's in the book. And, they just didn't notice it before because, right, because they needed. They didn't realize that was the, that key to unlock that door right, that they needed. They so, so, exactly. So talk to us then about like of the of the practices. Give us some examples within the practices of some of like the biggest 
small things? The biggest small things. Um, okay. So here is, um, so here's, here's one of the, of the big small things that I think is often overlooked. Um, one of the practices, practice number five, is that when students ask questions, we're supposed to, and if it's a stop thinking question, or if it's a proximity question, we're supposed to smile and walk away. And this idea of smiling and walking away is supposed to, is it, 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 it does a lot of things. Um, but it, both of those elements are, are important, the smiling and the walking away, right? So the smiling is acknowledgement that I've heard you, right? I've heard you. I hear you. There's a huge difference between not answering a student's question when, and, and having them think that you didn't hear them and, answer, and not answering a question when you smile at them and acknowledge that you've heard them and then you walk away. Um, you know, for a long time, like right now, nowadays we talk about um, uh the growth mindset and fixed mindset and growth mindset is great and it's, it's awesome. Um, but when we talk about growth mindset and fixed mindset, it's very binary, right? Like the, either the students has a fixed mindset or they have a growth mindset. And, but before we talked about fixed mindset and growth mindset, we used to talk about self-efficacy, um, student self-efficacy. And, and the research shows, and we all know this, that um, if a student uh, a student has really high self-efficacy, high self-belief, belief in their own ability. They perform better. And students with a low self-efficacy, low belief in themselves, they perform worse. And this goes all the way back to the old Henry Ford adage, right? Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right, right? And this idea that positive self-talk is incredibly important. Um, well, self-efficacy is not binary. It's not that you either have positive or you have negative. It's you can start with negative and you can work your way to positive. And one of the things that I have found is that there are some mile posts, mile markers on this journey from negative self-efficacy to positive self-efficacy. And the first one is they have to encounter a teacher who believes in them. Before a student can believe in themselves, they have to encounter a teacher who believes in them. Right. And that's the first mile marker. Um, but here's the interesting thing, because the research is also showing that kids don't listen to what we say. They listen to what we do. So you can say, I believe in them, I believe in you, but what are you doing to show that you believe in them, right? And, and the research showed that there are two things in thinking classrooms that actually communicates to kids that we believe in them. Number one, smiling and walking away. When I interview kids, uh, in that setting where I'm in the classroom and I'm huddled up with the kids and then they ask the teacher a question, the teacher smiles and walk away. And I'm like, what was that? You just asked her a question. She just smiled and walked away. And the kids are like, yeah, she does that a lot. Well, what does that mean? It means she thinks we can do it. Now, isn't that interesting, right? So they're hearing that we have confidence in them. The other thing that communicates that we believe in them, random groups. Now, random groups is a big move, but it communicates, it shows them that we believe in them. When I interview kids who are in random group settings, they always say the same thing. My teacher thinks we're all the same. Otherwise, they wouldn't do random groups. Or my teacher believes that we're all capable. Otherwise, they wouldn't do random groups, right? Like, so how are we communicating what it is that we believe and, and so on? So that was one of them. That smiling and walking away was, was, a, was one of them. But it's not just the smiling. It's also the walking away. We also found the same thing in Chapter 9 when we're talking about hints and extensions and how important it is that after you've given the students a hint or an extension, that the first thing you do is walk away. If you give students an extension and you stick around, they just ask you a bunch of questions on it. And, now, and, and you know, they're not talking to them each other. They're talking to me. Uh, and before you know it, I'm answering those questions because I can't help it. Um, but when we give a hint, one of the things we found is we give a hint and then we walk away. Um, if we don't, the kids get incredibly anxious because I've just given them a hint and they haven't yet figured out what that hint is. They don't, it's a hint. I'm not telling them exactly. So they have to process it. But now I'm standing there staring at them to see if they're processing it correctly. And it makes them anxious. So this idea of walking away is 
is a little thing that we need to do more. And so often I talk to teachers about this. And the number one thing that teachers say when they observe me teach is they can't believe the pace. And it's not that I'm running. It's that I spend very little time with each, each group, that the tempo is high, that it's like I give a hint and I walk away. And they, they always say, I have to do more of that because I get stuck. I get stuck there. And then the rest of the class isn't being serviced. And, I, I, and you know, it's a vortex. You get, you get in there. You want to be helpful. The kids start asking you questions. And it just, it just sucks you in. And before you know it, it's five and a half minutes have gone by. Yeah. So it's a little thing. Walk away. Walk away. That's one of the, the things I see most often brought up, maybe like in the Facebook group, um, is teachers who are having challenges with the classroom management and they feel like they're stuck with one group and every other group is kind of wave, standing there, raising their hands, waiting to come get validated. And yeah. so what you're saying is that this this movement, this walking away is the one of the small things that builds their self-efficacy, that keeps you moving and on your toes and it gives them the space to think without yeah. that performance anxiety of yeah. you standing or for them waiting there for you to give them the next thing yeah. because that's what they're accustomed to. That's what they've been conditioned to. Yeah. And you know what you just said there, this idea of validation, like this was, I was in a classroom last week and the teacher goes, you know, just so you know, in case you walk, see me walk by and put a little check mark or a little star on the kids like that. They like, they need to feel validated. And I said, yeah, we're not doing that today. Um, you should. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, and so that, like this validation has to come more intrinsically. Um, one of the things that we noticed in our research, and some teachers here might, might be able to connect with this, is that you'll have students like covering their work. They're working at the whiteboard, but they're hiding their work from others. And they're hoarding their answers, right? Like they're, mm -hmm. they don't want that. They don't want that other groups to see it. And they're copying. Hey, Mrs., they're copying us. Um, one of the things that was almost universally true was whenever we saw that, we were in a classroom where the teacher gave too much praise. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it is really interesting. Uh, because we think like praise, that would be a good thing, especially, you know, self-efficacy, we're trying to praise. But how do we show confidence rather than say confidence? Oh. But and it's like praise seems like such an innocuous thing. There's been research that shows that too much praise can be have a negative impact. But what we were finding was that the students were hoarding. They, because if you give out praise to someone for work they didn't do, then I, I may not get praise for my work. Right. So despite the fact that there's a lot of praise, there's not unlimited praise. So I don't want you to get praise for something I did. Um, and I talk to teachers and how, how sensitive this is, uh, because we want to be affirming for our kids and so on. So one of the things that I always say is, well, you want to praise the thing you want to see again tomorrow. If, you, if you're going to praise the kids, praise them for something you want to see again tomorrow. Right. Like, I really liked how you shared that marker today. Or I love the way that you were letting another group look at your work and, and, and get ideas from you. Like, praise the thing you want to see again tomorrow. Don't praise answers right so what did i do in that classroom where the teacher was used to giving praise uh the students it was it was funny because they didn't really need it uh but every once in a while i would encounter a group where like so is this you know is this right and i my answer was well did you did you double check your work and they're like yep yeah. how do you feel about it if we feel pretty good um does everybody feel the same yet yeah, we all feel the same so what should you do next and they're like, go on to the next task. And I'm like, sounds good to me. And it was like this sort of, how can I reposition that extrinsic validation into more intrinsic validation? Not that I want to let an error live on the board. If there's an error, I'll circle it. But I mean, like, I need them to also feel good about judging themselves. Yeah, and it's not you offering that validation that reinforces the, the norms of answer getting. And yeah. prioritizing answer getting over the thinking and the process and this the problem solving that yeah. they're doing. Yeah, we really want to prioritize the process. Yeah. It's it's just much more effective. And that's the thing that's going to carry them forward, right? Yeah. yeah. And there's a huge difference between students, and this is this is key. There's a huge difference between students having an answer and knowing it must be the answer. Right? Like students come up with answers all day, every day. They they have answers, you know tons 
that's not as valuable as knowing it must be the answer. Like that's really where we want to get the students to and where that validation comes from. I don't mind if they check with another group. I don't mind if they check with each other. I don't mind all of these things. This is important. But if I become the answer guy, mm -hmm. then they, they stop sort of creating that drive in themselves to pursue the knowing that they have the right answer. Yeah. And I've seen you do this in, um, in workshops too. And there's, there's a phrase that you use. Okay. Talk, talk to us about when you, when you bring two groups together, rather yeah. than just saying, yes, that's right. Or yes, that's wrong. Move on. What do you do? What do you say? So to me, that's uh, a big, small thing. I've Yeah. That's a big, that small thing, thing, right? Like, um, I did, I did this last week. There was two groups who had the same question. They had different answers and they were out by magnitude of 10. Um, and uh, I brought the two groups together and I circled the two answers and I said, this group has this answer. This group has this answer. I can guarantee you that at least one of these answers is incorrect. Um, but I'm also willing to bet that there's a lot you agree on. And I drew a little Venn diagram that overlapped and I shaded in the part that was overlapping. I said, start talking about the stuff you agree on. And then I just walked away. Mm -hmm. And I came back a few minutes later and everyone's smiling. They're going, yep, we got it. We figured it out. And what does that do? That language of at least one of you, at least one of these answers is incorrect. Okay. Ta like get into the, the weeds of that language a little bit. Cause I think that's yeah. really critical. There's a lot of little things in there. Okay, so There's first, a ton of little things in there. First of all, when we put two groups together, we want them to be a team, right? So if I put two groups together and say, this group is wrong, are they a team? No. If I put two groups together and say, this group is right, are they a team? No, they're not a team. Um, but if I put two groups together and say, at least one of these answers is incorrect, um, they are now, nobody's in a position of no one is in this position of feeling like they're up on their high horse or someone's down in the dirt. Everyone's just like, okay, something's wrong here and we got to figure it out. Nobody is given any sort of position of power that way. But there's another subtlety here, right? And it comes from this idea of, of um, growth mindset, right? It's, it's not one of these groups is wrong. Not at least one of these groups is wrong. At least one of these answers is wrong. Right. It depersonalizes. Yes. Groups are not wrong. They're just not yet right. Right. Like it's just like if we want that growth mindset, it's about we're still moving forward. The the you know the bus is still moving. We're still learning. Um but it's the answer can be wrong. One of these answers is wrong. I feel like we should put that on a t-shirt. Groups aren't wrong. They're just not yet right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so there's there's some little things again. Yeah. So I'm hearing, so here's some of the little things I'm hearing. I'm hearing smile and walk away. Yeah. In other words, the things you do to validate them intrinsically without praise. Yes. Um, showing them the confidence rather than saying it. Yes. Um, using these small turns of phrase and being very specific to drive what you value, which is the thinking. Yeah. and the collaboration rather than the answer getting and the who is right. Yeah. These to me are all very social emotional learning kinds of mm -hmm. things that I'm seeing in the chat. People are starting to go SEL, SEL. Yeah. Um, are all the little things about SEL or are there little things that attend to other aspects of okay. this? Okay, so I'll give you two. Uh, let me give you two that are efficiency based that are good for us as teachers. Okay, so the first one is something we call the banner. Now, the banner is not mentioned in the book, but in chapter eight of the book, we talk about or I talk about specifically how we can help help students develop a certain level of autonomy so that knowledge can mobilize around the room. Right. We want students to be looking at a group for the next task. We want students to be looking at uh, a group if they're stuck. We want them talking to each other. We want knowledge to move around the room. Not um, hoarding that. that right. right Supporting it, right? Yeah, we want yeah. knowledge to move around the room. The smartest person in the room is the room, right? We just got to get that knowledge moving. Um, and I talk about how we want to get the students comfortable with if they if they're done and they need another task to look at another person's board, another group's board, and figure out what the next task is and steal it. Don't wait for the teacher. Um, 
but it's it's tricky because they're like they're looking at the board and they're you know like you've seen some grade nine students boards it looks like chaos and you're trying to figure out what task is the next task and you're trying to see the task without seeing the answer and and so on so shortly after the book was created or published we created something we call the banner just to streamline this so the banner is a top six inches of your board uh, and there are three rules associated with the banner rule number one whatever task you're working on you put in the banner just the task rule number two um you oh, or, oh sorry rule number one you put the task in the banner and you do your work below the banner okay you never put the answer in the banner just your work below the banner and the banner's just it's just a line right it's, it's just, just a line, line. It's, it's just a not, line it's nothing fancy nope um rule number two when you're done your task and you know you're done don't wait for the teacher look around at everybody else's banner and steal a task you haven't done yet and then and then but now you've got to go back to rule number one which is you erase your banner you put the new banner up all right um rule Number three is never make up your own task and put it on the banner um, you, because it messes up the flow, the thin slicing sequence that the teachers worked hard to create. Um, you can Kids can make up their own tasks, just don't put it on the banner. And this has become tremendously helpful. It creates an efficiency for the teacher. You now don't have to run around and give a new task to every group. You just have to give it to the first group that's done. They put it on their banner and everyone else steals it, right? But there's even little things packed around this. So for example, we found that if there's more than three choices, the students may make bad choices, right? So if there's like six different tasks up there, a student may jump from task number two to task number eight, and that's too big a jump in complexity, and now they're out of flow. So we you've want- you've sliced these tasks, right? And, yeah. and they may catch, they may realize they're taking something from a group that's like six steps ahead of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we got to keep it tight. Right. So what we found is no more than three options out there. And and so that if a group steals incorrectly, which rarely happens, um, it's not the end of the world. They haven't gotten too far out of range. Um, so what do we do with the kids who are the groups who are storming ahead? Well, we give them the next task. We just tell them not to put it on the banner so that we're not getting that front end getting out too far. Yeah. And if there's a group that's way behind. We just kind of keep an eye on them and when they're ready for the next task, we're just there to give it to them. But everybody else is sort of managing themselves through this banner. So it that works. reduces the amount of time they need to spend trying to figure out what time they can just kind of catch up. Yeah. Yeah. And they just Get grab the it. Now, yeah. the first thing, and I saw, well, how do, shouldn't we number them? No. The minute you number those, the kids start racing. And this right. is the thing that's so fascinating. The banner is a tremendous time saver for you but if you do it wrong it becomes it shifts a behavior towards a negative so we don't number them because then the kids are racing uh or they feel like defeated because they're on number three and i can see a number eight and and so on and so forth so again we don't try to trigger that racing response that compete competition response and it's not that everyone is racing it's about 20 percent are racing but there goes the empathy that lead person grabs a marker and now they're just racing. So it's it's these little things that really shift student behaviors for the positive or for the negative. So the banner is, for example, and is, um, is a little thing that really makes our job easier, right? It allows us to thin slice and, and keep, and now we just have to focus on hints. We can really just focus on hints and monitoring the students where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, and that's 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 an example of something that is really beneficial for us as teachers. Um, here's another little thing that really is beneficial. I get asked all the time, especially with a high tempo, like, how do you know where to go? Like, like there's 10 groups are all buzzing away. How do you know which group needs you? And here's a little tip. And uh, I don't think I've ever said this before in a in this sort of a medium. I never, I never look at the boards. Oh. Don't look at the boards. Look at the body language. The body language will tell you where you need to go. Say more you'll, about that. You'll, you'll see immediately when a group is frustrated or an individual is frustrated. It just manifests in their body language. You'll see a group that's done. You'll see a group that's struggling uh, and persevering. You just, you can just see the body language so clearly, and it tells you exactly where you need to go. This group is done. I got to get there and give them an extension. This group is struggling. They need a hint, right? This group is struggling, but they're still in that sort of productive struggle mode. They're, you know, they're grinding away. I'm just going to keep an eye on them. I don't want them to, to fall off the back end of that. Um, 
I read body language and it's, it's just such a nice, efficient move. It tells me where I need to go. As I'm on my way there, I read the board. Mm, so okay. the body language tells me where I need to go. The board tells me what I need to do when I get there. Right. Yeah. And one of the things I've noticed you notice before, too, is when a group is being dominated by one person in the yeah. group. And that's, that's something I hear teachers say. And there's a thing you do when that happens. Tell us what you do when. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can be subtle. So you can just step in and ask for the marker and, and then you talk to them and you hold the marker. It's just like a talking stick. And then as you leave, you just hand the marker to somebody else. So that's a subtle move. A more abrupt move is you just step in and you pluck. If someone's doing all the writing and all the talking, you just pluck the marker out of their hand and hand it to someone else. And you just turn to the person who was doing all the talking and writing and says, continue. You have great ideas. Keep talking. But now we displace that so that not all of that energy is in one spot. Well, right? And smile. I've always seen and you smile, smile when you do it. Smile. You're acknowledging, again, like, yeah. like with smile and walk away. You're acknowledging. Yeah. You're not yeah. doing something wrong. Yeah. I'm I'm going to I'm going to help you move this direction. Yeah. And if there's someone who's really vulnerable in that space, someone who is really you can tell their body language is telling that they don't feel safe at, at, at contributing right now is I'll often hand them the marker and I'll just say, "Listen. I know that you have lots of ideas, Aaron. Aaron, I know you have lots of ideas, but I'm giving you the marker. You're not allowed to write any of your own ideas here." You can only write the ideas of what the other students tell you. And like the student is like, oh, shucks, I had so many ideas. <laughs> but I've just made this really a safe space for them to now be the writer because I've I've told them that, and I've told the whole group that they now have to channel the other ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I see someone post it. Well, what do you do if a group has a wrong answer? Like you, you, you see that they're done. You're walking towards the board, and then you see that they have the wrong answer. I just pull out my red pen and I circle something, and I say, "Yeah, you may want to look at that." And then I walk okay. away. Or you can do the thing where you look at find the other group that has a different yeah. answer and pair yeah. them up. Yeah, there's so many little things. There's one other thing that I find is is it's a small thing, and it's teachers are going to be surprised by this. So. Like one of the things that teachers often complain about is like, I can't defront my room. I don't have enough room. If I defront my desks, it's not a, an ideal packing strategy. Now everything is up against the boards and I just, no one can move and it's all tight and everything like this. And, and here's the funny thing about this. I, you know, I spent a lot of time interviewing kids and listening to kids and trying to think the way kids think and trying to understand how our actions as a teacher has an impact on their behavior and their, and their thinking. Um, so I spend a lot of time rattling around inside of kids' heads. Um, and, and I try as much as possible not to do the same thing to the teachers. The teachers are my colleagues, my collaborators. I'm trying not to get inside your head and, and rattle around in there. Um, but sometimes I can't help it. Um, <laughs> and, and like, so here's one of the things that I've noticed. So psychologically, from a teacher perspective, is uh, we all know that furniture moves, Right. Like we do, because in August we put it in place and get it exactly where we want it and then never move it again. But we do know it moves. But somehow we forget that by September. Um, and it's this funny thing that I see in teachers that teachers have this all this flexibility in their thinking in the first four weeks of school. And then everything is sort of set in stone. And, and part of that psychology is the fact that that's what we're trying to do for the kids. We're trying to create routines. And now the routines are set. We want to be set. But furniture moves. And it moves every day. So I want teachers to think about this. What is, if you knew that your students were going to be at the whiteboards all day tomorrow, like all day, all day, where would you want your furniture to be? Right. And that's the way you want the furniture to be when the kids are at the whiteboards. And now think about the fact that the day after, you know, the kids are going to be in their desks all day. Like they're going to be in the desk all day. They're never going to go to the whiteboard. Where do you want the furniture to be then? Right. Well, that's where you want the furniture to be when the kids are in, the, in their desks. And then you just have to transform between those two configurations, depending on what you're doing in the room, because kids are never standing and sitting at the same time. Right. And you have a whole army of kids who can help you with that. 
it it takes like two, 30 seconds to transform a room if you in, enlist all the kids. And the kids like to do that. So you just say, we're going to the boards, get the furniture in place, and they they move it. Okay, we're going, we're going to be back at our desk, get the furniture back where it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I've been in classrooms where I've seen that and it gives them such a sense of power and autonomy over their space because it's their space, right? It's not your space that they're inhabiting. It's their space, their learning space. And it's a, it's a, it's a flexible space. Yeah. We often think about flexible learning spaces as spaces where students have choice, but not spaces where stuff. The actually... room actually changes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you might uh, you could sit in a beanbag chair or you could sit on one of those wobbly things or you can stand. Those are your choices. But yeah, yeah, the but desks all clump together the or the desks all spread apart. Totally different yeah. concept. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to change gears a little bit. Um, you've been working on your next set of books, I know. Yes. Uh, which are all about mathematical tasks. And mm -hmm. for those who haven't heard yet, uh, the first one is a K-5 book that you co-authored with Megan Giroux yeah. from Regina. Uh, and that will be available in May. And then I know you're working on a 612 book and we're collectively hoping to have that out for everyone in the fall. Um, and, you know, I had the pleasure of getting to work with you on these over the last couple of years, year and a half, um, and getting again, down into the weeds of these little things. And there's lots of things that were even in the first book that I had forgotten were in the first book that you go into even greater detail in these new books and yeah. then some new things too. So give us just a tiny little like preview of a couple of the things that you are really hoping people will kind of tune into with mm. um, these tasks yeah. books. So first of all, like it, it's sort of ironic. I always say we, the world doesn't need more tasks and then I'm producing two books on tasks. Um, and I still believe that, but if we're going to make a book about tasks, let's talk about how to use those tasks within the lesson. So the task is a vehicle um, and then everything around it. So each of the books has 20 non-curricular tasks, but it's not just the task. It's the launch script, right? How are we going to launch it? It's got all the extensions. It's got the differentiation notes. It, But most importantly, it talks about how to close out the lesson. How do we close out this activity? What are... What are the, the mild, medium, spicy, check your understanding questions that may, we may want to do? So, so the, the non-curriculars are really positioned in such a way that it's, like, it's got everything you need there. Plus room for you to make notes because, of course, a task is inert. It's you that brings it to life. We've given you some pointers, but then you are going to have to make notes about things that you would change next time. Um, the curricular tasks are very similar in the sense that it's a it, it provides a thin slice sequence of tasks that you can do to create that flow, uh, but it has a launch script. It has all of the, the thin slice sequence extensions, and now it really focuses in on how to close the lesson. So all of the new research is around the closing the lesson. What is the, the new form of consolidation, one that works better with convergent tasks? What is the new note template that works well uh, for all students, actually, kindergarten to grade 12. Um, and here it is. Here's actually the template, and here are the things to put in that template. And then what is the new form of check your understanding questions where we we break it up into three categories, mild, medium, spicy, and here are those questions. So it's, uh, it's going to contain all of that, all of that new research on how to close a lesson. And it's really like a full, there's your lesson plan with everything you need in it with the recognition that you're going to have to make it your own and you're going to have to adjust things to make it your own. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's what the body contain. Uh, then I kind of have this closing, we have this closing section on, you know, what do you do next after this? Like from page to practice, what are you going to do? Like, how do you find more tasks if you need them? How do you, how do you take a task that you find maybe online or that you is one of your favorites and how do you, put it into the template that's in here and, and get all of those pieces that you need, the launch script, the, the closing pieces and so on and so forth. It's got all that. And, and I just saw someone asking if that can be adapted for pre-K too. I'm assuming there's, there's no reason not. I mean, it's all based on content. It's not grade yeah. banded because no. every, everywhere you, you go, the standards are a little bit different and a little bit shuffled around. So yeah. um, I know you tried hard to kind of, 
cover some of the big ideas in those grade bands. Yeah, everything from incredibly novel ways to teach analog time all mm-hmm. the way up to fractions and so on and so forth. So it's it's banded by topic. The curricular ones are banded by topic. The non-curriculars are banded more by sort of perseverance scale, we call it, which is mm-hmm. like this for grade one students, this task would be a perseverance level three. Uh, but for a grade three student, it's a perseverance level two. And for a grade five, it's a perseverance level one. And then you can pick your perseverance levels based on, you know, how much tenacity you have instilled within your students. Yeah. And how long you've been enculturating them to yeah. working in this way. Um, and one of my favorite sections was toward the end in what you were describing about um, thin slicing and curricular tasks, because it, it answers a question that I hear all the time. And I, I will say, when I read it, I was like, oh, that's how that works. That's how you thin slice it. And so just tell us, share a little bit. You don't have to give a lot of detail because I don't want to I don't want to put any spoilers out, but share a little bit about just kind of how you cover that that topic. So it's I take a look at how to thin slice a topic from scratch, which is um which really is about where is it we want, where do we start? Like, what do we take for granted that students know? Uh, and I'm going to come back to that point, but where's our starting point? Where do we want, what do we want students to be able to do at the end? Um, and and then we sort of select what are the types of tasks that are between that start and that finish, right? Like, there are clearly different types of tasks and then we do so that's called selecting and then we do grouping because some of these actually belong together right okay. within a category yeah this one is different but it's not so different it's more of a, a very a slight variance but this one is really different so that's a different like, type. there's a cognitive leap that has to happen between yeah. that kind and that kind yeah. so we kind of lay out the different the different tasks that kids are going to encounter, we 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 lump them and split them until we get basically three categories of tasks, and then we fill them. We fill that space in with with more tasks so that we get that thin size sequence. And I take you through an example of how to do that, and I articulate pretty clearly what what that's about. Um, but it's you know it's not magic. It's really just thinking about where is it that we are starting and where is it we want to go and what are the things that students are going to encounter on the way. And our resources are a great source of, of these types of tasks. It's really just about how we, we pull it together and sequence it correctly. Um, that was the, the, the part that really uh, that I um, that came to life for me was just the, the logic that gets imposed on that so that you don't just have this sort of random series of tasks yeah. but that you're very, very intentionally and thoughtfully ordering. <laughs> And then it connects back to how you consolidate, it connects to your, your check your understanding questions, your spicy, medium, and mild, it connects to your notes, it connects all of that. Yeah, it all, once it's in place in those three categories, everything else falls out naturally. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I will say, and this is a little thing, uh, is we start off on an assumption that kids know something, right? Like we have to start our planning on the assumption that kids know something. But we all know as teachers, if we start our lesson on the assumption that kids know something from last year, we are dead in the water. Like this lesson is going off the rails within the first 30 seconds. So there is, despite the fact that our planning starts on an assumption that students are somewhere, our launch has to revisit these ideas and to activate that prior knowledge, reinforce it so that everyone is on the same page before we enter into that sequence. So right. it's sort of a, an, a, an irony there, right? We have to start planning on the assumption that kids know something, but then we have to launch on the assumption that they don't. Or that some don't and some do, and they all need to. And so, yeah. And it's one of those big, small things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. A couple of questions are popping out to me. One person's asking if you've done this in a classroom with students who all have learning disabilities. Has that, um, I'm sure that comes so, up. So yes and no. Um, so first of all, we don't do that here in Canada. We don't have classrooms where all the students are, are congregated that have some sort of uh, label, let's call it. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. We integrate our students out. We may have some pull out, 
where students are getting additional support, but most of it is push in uh, if there, and so on. So it's, um, so the research is all done in classrooms where students are integrated in. Having said that, this is being implemented across the world and there are places where this still happens and i've worked with numerous teachers who work in those settings and 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 i've been in those settings with those teachers and yeah it you know of course it works and it doesn't work it the, just like everything else in thinking classrooms it works or it doesn't work but that depends on your passion for making it happen and the way you pay attention to the little things um and in that space what is really really important is to first of all work on really strong relationship building um, and i'm not talking about relationships between students that is important but i'm talking about the relationship between the teacher and the students and and actually i'm not talking about the relationship between the teacher and the student but the relationship between the teacher and the child so really building those strong relationships the most effective teachers i've seen in these settings have really good respectful relationships with their students as people uh, because when we keep, when we're working with students who are, who have these labels, uh, by definition, these students are, it's hard to see them and, and treat them as something other than deficit when we keep focusing on the student. And when we do that, it just has this negative impact, right? Because as a student, they are struggling for whatever reason, whether it's social, emotional, whether it's cognitive, whether it's behavioral, whatever it is, they're struggling. And when we keep treating them like students, we're always treating them as a, as a student who's struggling. So how can we treat focus in on the child? So building those really strong, respectful relationships with the child, seeing them as capable of a, a capable person, and then working on the relationships with, between the kids, and then letting go, and there's this irony, right? Like we're like let's let's put all of these kids in the same classroom. They all have different needs, and they're all in different places. And now you gotta have them. You gotta stick with fidelity to the curriculum, and you gotta be ready for that standardized test. Which seems like just such an oxymoron. Like by nat by definition, these kids need a much more sensitive treatment. And and how we prioritize them as learners over curriculum as the thing that we have to get through is also vital. The most successful teachers focus much more on the learner than the, than the content. Right. So yeah, it, it works. It's, but again, if you don't do these little things and these big things, then you're just, you're also asking yourself for trouble. And that's true of any class. Yeah. 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 Well, listen, we're almost out of time. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I know Margaret has a couple of book giveaways to do, but I just think this has been such a wonderful conversation full of learning and um, hopefully lots of good, you know, small tips and things people can walk away with and implement. And it'll, it'll help smooth some of those ruffles that they feel sometimes when they're diving into this work. So thank you, Peter. And I will say this, that at the second annual international BTC conference in Phoenix in July 2024, my opening keynote is going to be, or it might be my closing, I haven't decided yet, but one of the keynotes are, is going to be about the little things that matter. That's awesome. Yeah. And so for anyone who's not aware of that, the conference is going to be in Phoenix um, July 1st and 2nd. Uh, if you just Google BTC 2024 Arizona, you'll find it. Registration is open. Um, I know the conference committee is looking for proposals for other people to come in and, and present as well. So um, hopefully we'll get to see you there. Thanks, Peter. My pleasure. Thanks for um, the conversation here.